Chris Godinas, licensed professional counselor, also the host of We Need to Talk on every Sunday at noon. This video is for educational and informational purposes only. The views and opinions stated herein are mine and mine alone. They do not represent the ACA, the APA, or any other therapist for that matter. Boom, shakalaka done. I would like to thank my Wednesday sponsor, tryfuture.co slash Chris Godinas. I am now down 14 pounds. I was down 13 pounds last week. I'm down another pound this week. I've lost a total of 14 pounds. Tryfuture.co slash Chris Godinas is, you can take your, your, your trainer with you everywhere, which is great. And having that motivation and that check-in and that accountability is fantastic. And they can, what's the word I'm looking for? They can make the exercises specific to what you can do. So say, for example, you're at the office, you don't have weights with you. They can make exercises that are just using body weight alone, which is fantastic. So let 2023 be the year that you get in shape, not just mentally, not just working on the self-esteem and all that sort of cool stuff, but physically too, because mental and physical go together. So thank you. Tryfuture.co slash Chris Godinas. Thank you very much. Okay, let's dive into the questions, shall we? All right. Um, is there any way to distinguish situational from clinical depression before the situation changes? Well, it's very hard to. So basically with, where is my DSM? Okay, so severe depression. Let's look this up. Hang on, hang on, hang on. So with severe depression, it generally lasts every day, most of the day, three months to six months is generally what defines that. Situational is something that changes. Situational is not every day. It's not, um, okay, major just depressive disorder. Okay, 160, hang on. So situational, it's not every single day. It's not um, most of the day. It's just kind of intermittent and kind of there. Okay, major depressive disorder. Five or more of the following symptoms have been present during the same two-week period and represent a change from previous functioning. At least one of the symptoms is either depressed mood or loss of interest or pleasure. So one, depressed mood most of the day, nearly every day, as indicated by either subjective report, feeling sad, empty, hopeless, or observation made by others, for example, appears tearful. Uh, two, markedly diminished interest or pleasure in all or almost all activities, most of the day, most of the day, nearly every day, as indicated by either subjective account or observation. Three, significant weight loss when not dieting or weight gain, a change of more than 5% of body weight in one month, or decrease or increase in appetite nearly every day. Four, insomnia or hypersomnia nearly every day. So, Basically, it's severe depression. It's like most of the day, nearly every day or every day. When it's situational, it kind of comes and goes. It's not most of the day. It's some of the day, but not most of the day. So that's kind of how you tell the difference. And again, when you're in the middle of it, it's really hard to see. And sometimes it takes a professional to kind of help guide you as to what's going on. Okay, the continuation of this. Uh, psychomotor, psychomotor agitation or retardation nearly every day, observ observable by others, not merely subjective feelings of restlessness or being slowed down. Six, fatigue or loss of energy nearly every day. Seven, feelings of worthlessness or excessive or inappropriate guilt. Keyword here is inappropriate guilt, uh, which may be delusional nearly every day, not merely self-reproach, or guilt about being sick. So it's like this existential kind of guilt for existing, a lot of cases. Um, diminished ability to think or concentrate or indecisiveness nearly every day, either by subjective account or as observed by others. So in other words, the depression is bad enough that other people are noticing it. Other people are like, ooh, what's going on? Are you okay? Recurrent thoughts of death, not just fear of dying. Recurrent suicidal ideation without a specific plan or suicidal attempts suicide attempts, or specific plan for committing suicide. The symptoms cause clinically significant distress and or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. The episode is not attributable to the, 
physiological effects of substances or to other medical conditions. So it's it's the intensity. It's the intensity. So it's it's like most of the day, every day or nearly every day. So that's kind of how you tell the difference. And clinical can come from situational. So if the situational does not change or if it's an ongoing kind of abuse thing, you're in that survivor mode, you're in that anxious mode, you're in that depressed mode, and it just keeps going and going and going. That's when you need to make sure that you're talking to a good therapist. And if you cannot resolve it using talk therapy or Eastern medicines, then you want to look at, obviously, Western medicine. So that's kind of that. I hope that answered the question. So it's intense. It's it's super, super intense. And it's every day or nearly every day. And it's most of the day. So in other words, there's no reprieve. There's no break from it. There's no, there's no chance to kind of feel okay at all. It's like, it's just unrelenting. So that's how you tell the difference. Okay. How do you get through grief? It's been two years since I lost my 33 year old daughter. I'm so sorry. And I'm still falling apart. That's totally normal. Oh my God, that is totally normal. So in our society, <coughs> excuse me, it, it, we don't deal well with death in our society. We really don't. So here's the deal. Grief is not something to get through necessarily. It is something we learn to live with. And losing a child, I, I cannot even imagine how horrific that must have been for you. And I am so, so sorry because we don't ever stop loving them, even though they're gone, even though they're dead, we don't stop loving them. And that loss, that emptiness, that them not being there, that not seeing them grow old, not seeing them see their kids, you know, graduations or whatever, that is devastating. So grief is not something to be gotten through. It is something to learn to live with. You are always going to love her. You are always going to miss her. Oh God, I'm going to start crying. Jesus. So when we love, unlike narcissists, narcissists do not love, okay? When we love and a person we love or a child we love or an animal we love or anybody we love, sentient, that we love, dies, our grief is in, I'm sorry, direct proportion to how much we loved. Two years is nothing. You loved that child. You raised that child to age 33. You had 33 years with them. You had all these hopes and dreams for them. They've been gone two years. It does get easier. I'm not going to say it's going to get better, but it does get easier. The grief kind of the edges come off of it eventually, but two years is not a long time as far as emotions are concerned. It really isn't. So the way to get along with the grief is to make friends with it, not to resist it, not to, oh, no, 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 no. I don't want to feel it. I don't want to cry. I don't want to do whatever. It's like, no, you've lost your child. Your child was 33 years old and you've lost them. They are dead. This is horrible. This is horrific. And get with a good therapist. Work through the feelings with the therapist. It, you're not going to ever stop grieving them. So how do I explain this? My grandmother on my dad's side died when I was, I think, eight years old. I think about her all the time. It's been over, gosh, over 40 years. And it's not as intense as it was when it first happened, but I still grieve her. I still miss her. There are things that I wish I could call her up and say, oh, wow, Momo, this is what we did. And this is what happened. And gosh, you would have loved this. And, you know, things like that. And, you know, my mom passed away in 2016. And there are days when I just sit in the car and pretend that I'm talking to her because I miss her so much, even though she had her issues, you know. So grief is ongoing. It is. And it 
the first two years are hard because the first year is getting through all of the firsts. It's like the first Christmas, the first New Year's, the first Easter, the first birthday, the first anniversary, the first and then the anniversary of the death, all of the holidays. It's the first year is the hardest. The second year we have got to learn or we have learned to kind of, okay, this is the new normal. This is, this is what is. And this person is not, not coming back. And it sucks. And it does. And I, I wish there was a magic wand that I could wave that would just make it easier for you. But I can't. So it's kind of acknowledging that this second year, oh, Christ, it sucks. It does. It's, it's the new normal. It's, okay, they're gone. I'm going to have to learn to live with the fact that they're gone, okay? The third year is when we start moving them into a different spot in our heart. And it's intense, but it's not as intense as the first and the second year have been. So grief is normal. I just, you lost your daughter. Grief is normal. And, and that intense grief is normal. And it makes me so angry when society or, you know, sometimes even counselors will be like, oh, you need to get over it. And I'm just like, you need to suck an egg. You know, I mean, no, we don't get over it, especially when we've lost a child. That is horrific. It is. So it's it's going to take time. It going It's going to take time. And it's talking about the person. I think the biggest mistake we make in society is that we suddenly act as if the person never existed. And I think the reason we do that is because we're afraid of upsetting the survivor. And the reality of it is we need to talk about them. We, that's how we keep them alive in our hearts, in our heads is by sharing stories and talking about them. And, oh, remember when they did this? Or oh, do you remember when we did that together? Or when we went to this place together? Or that great meal we had together? Or do you remember when? And it keeps them alive for us. And it helps. It does. It's painful. It hurts. But it still helps. So I think what hurts worse is when we act as if the person never existed. And a lot of survivors, a lot of, you know, people who've lost their children, people who've lost spouses, that is the number one thing they tell me is that people will not talk about the loved one who died. And our society's got a weird idea about death. We really do. And it's like somehow it's not supposed to be talked about or somehow we're not supposed to grieve or we're supposed to get over it in this certain amount of time. And it's like, I'm sorry, are you human? That doesn't work that way. It doesn't. It's like it takes time to process and it takes time to accept that the person is gone and it takes time to move them into a different spot in your heart and it takes time to process all of the differing emotions and it takes time to train the people around us to talk about the loved one that died. So it's it's gonna it's gonna take time. Two years is nothing. And it is intense and it is draining and it is fatiguing and it is what's the word I'm looking for? A lot of big emotion. A lot of big emotion. And the best way to honor your child is to allow yourself to grieve, to talk about them to other people. I miss them. I miss the things they used to do. I miss the way they used to whatever, you know, talk about it. Two years out, that makes perfect sense. You know, it's by the third year that the edge starts getting taken off of it. Not a great deal, but enough so that you can function. Those first two years, when I used to work at the New Song Center, and I worked at the Dougie Center before that, when I was at those two clinics, their grief clinics, People would come in and freaking employers would tell a woman who lost her child that, oh, you need to get over it. And it was two weeks. No, 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 no. Normalize the grief. The grief is normal. The demand that we get over it 
is abnormal. That's abusive. Let's just let's just be clear about that. So allow yourself to grieve. Write and burn letters to her. You know, it's like, I miss you. I miss this about you. I miss, you know, whatever. It, it's processing. It's like, it's a way. And I did that with my mom too. It's like writing letters or what I, what I like to do with my mom is, and I still do that to this day is I'll get in the car and I'll pretend to have a whole conversation with her. Like I'm leaving her a message on a voicemail, you know? And so I'll just be like, Hey mom, it's me. Just wanted to let you know this, that, and the other thing happened. And I really miss you. And I wish you were here. And you know, that kind of thing. And it helps. It helps. It's never going to be a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's never going to be a substitute for talking to them in person, but it helps because it's like, our amygdalas can't really tell the difference. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, if we process it and we talk it out or we write them a letter and we let them know how much we miss them, it feels, it feels like we put a period on that particular sentence. I'm sorry, this is really, death sucks. Let's just put it to you that way. It, it sucks, it sucks for the survivors. So be gentle with yourself, drink plenty of water. You know, it's still, to this day, it's like my mom's been gone since 2016, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, coming up on 23, coming up on seven years. I'm still a mess when I talk about her because I miss her, you know? I don't think about her every day, but I think about her a lot. And that's kind of normal. That's normal. And I think that our society has made grief and made death somehow abnormal. And so we feel abnormal when we're doing this heavy, intense grieving. And the heavy, intense grieving is going to happen in that first two years. It gets a little less at the third year, a little more, a little less, more or less, you know what I'm saying, fourth year, fifth year, sixth year, seventh year. But I'll tell you, like I said, if I start talking about my grandma or my mom, this is what happens. So, and that's okay. And that's normal. And I'll tell you what, people who are uncomfortable with you grieving can go pound sand. Seriously. They can just go pound sand. Because you have a right to grieve and you have a right to feel what you're feeling. And like I said, the first two years are the hardest because the second year is the new normal. It's like the first year is the shock, getting through all of the firsts. And then the second year is like, oh, fudge, this is what it is. And it's acceptance and it's the new normal. And then the third year is, okay, I got it. She's gone. Whew, how can I continue on? And then it's, it's moving them into another spot in our heart and continuing on with our life. But for three years, yeah, it's it's not abnormal to just be heavy, intense grieving. You betcha. Absolutely. So there are books on grief out there. Just go down to Amazon and look for a book on grieving. The big thing about grieving is, is you don't want to stop it. You don't want to resist it. You don't want to push it off. You don't want to not deal with it. Allow, 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 and get with a good therapist to help you to normalize the grief. Our society has made grief somehow abnormal, and that's not true. What's abnormal is ignoring the grief. That's abnormal. So allowing yourself to grieve, allowing yourself to feel, allowing yourself to process, and you're going to feel all the different emotions, anger, sadness, hurts, confusion, you know, missing them, loving them, you know, sometimes being mad at them. Sometimes we get mad at them for dying and that's okay. That's okay. It's hard. It is hard. It is not easy. Grief is not easy. It is okay to be mad at them. You know, it's okay to be mad at them for dying. It is. It's just, it's part of the grieving process. So get onto Amazon, find a good book that's on the grieving process, how to help. And don't resist and get with a good therapist. That is going to help you the most. Write and burn. Write and burn letters or pretend to talk to her on the phone. That's another, or in the shower sometimes I'll talk to my mom. I'll be like, okay, mom, I'm leaving you a message, you know, and I'll just start talking. So yeah, grief sucks. Death sucks. It's not fun. But the biggest thing is don't, don't resist it. Don't shove it under the carpet. Yes, it's been two years and your daughter was your daughter you loved your daughter and this is normal this is normal and and 
the important thing is also taking care of yourself while you're in the middle of this heavy, intense grieving. And you are in the middle of this heavy, intense grieving. It's really hard for us to remember to drink water, not alcohol, drink water, eat enough food, get exercise, get sleep, because our minds are going, where is this person that was so important to me? Why is this person gone? What happened? We're also going to have existential crises. What happens after we die? Where do they go? You know, I always wished that mom would come back and haunt me. <laughs> Haven't seen her yet, but... <laughs> But, you know, it's it's a desire to hope to see them again because we love them. So you're normal. You're normal. It's okay. It's okay. You are falling apart right now. That's why it's important to get support. So there are support groups out there. Um, New Song Center is one. Uh, they mostly do children, I think. I mean, like little children. But find a support group for parents that have had a child die because that is important to get support. Somebody that understands, somebody that has been there, done that, gets it, can validate you and encourage you to go on and not stop. Because a lot of times when we're grieving, we just want to stop. We just want to stop and just stop, just stop. I've had it, stop, you know, and we've got to go on. So it's really important, get support. Get help, get to a therapist, allow yourself to grieve. You are not abnormal. It's only been two years, okay? This is normal. This is part of the grieving process. And this goes with basically any death, but in particular, the death of a child. First year is shock, getting through all the first. Second year is this horrific acceptance, like this is the new normal. And then the third year is, okay, this is the new normal, and we're going forward. So... I'm so sorry, sweetheart. I am so sorry. Gentle with you. Get with a good therapist. Get a support group. That's going to be your best thing. And being able to talk about your daughter. That's huge. And if you have family and friends that don't want to talk about the daughter, like you bring her up and they shut you down, mm -mm -mm -mm, wrong. Those are not the people you need to be going to. You need to be going to people who are going to let you talk about your daughter. Okay? Whew, I'm sorry. I am really, really... That sucks. I am really sorry. Okay. Um, how do you get over it being hard to get started when struggling to function? Okay. So that is a form of, that's the depression. All right. So getting started is the hardest thing when we are dealing with situational or clinical. So getting just one foot in front of the other. Um, so how you deal with it is you acknowledge it. This is hard. This is absolutely, I don't want to do it. I really don't. This is hard. And, <coughs> excuse me. And I got to go take a shower. And I got to get dinner done. And so you, you're going to struggle with it. You are. Again, normal given the stuff that we've been through so we're coming out of a dysfunctional relationship and we've got situational depression or we've got clinical depression and we struggle to get started we struggle to clean we struggle to get dressed we struggle to eat we struggle to it is a struggle and so you just acknowledge yes this is a struggle i am not smoking the ganja this is what is true for me and get help, get get somebody you can talk to, a support group, again, or a therapist, you know, somebody that can help give you hope and give you encouragement and maybe set you on the right track to getting you going again. So it is, it is you just acknowledge what is. You acknowledge what is and you allow yourself to validate yourself and you move on from that. And take the little victories. If all you did, like if you're struggling with depression and if all you did was able to get up and maybe brush your teeth today, great. That's awesome. Let's see if we can do that again tomorrow. I'm not kidding you. It's like baby steps. Gentle with you. It's when we come out of abuse, we, first of all, we're dealing with the shock and awe of the devalue and the discard. 
And we're dealing with the horrific realization that the person we thought we knew and that knew us didn't know us at all and that we didn't know them. That the real them was the abuser, not the love bombing. So that Prince Charming, Princess Charming was not real and who was real was the nasty person. And that is a slap in the face and it causes us to lose everything. We lose our sense of humor, we lose hope, we lose the magic in life, we lose everything because well, what is real? You know? And it's again an existential crisis. So it's, and I, I talked about that on the Facebook page as I posted uh, uh, Frankel. Uh, Frankel is, is uh, Man's Search for Meaning. And we have to find meaning. We have to find meaning in the meaningless because Cruelty is their point. That's it. And we have to find meaning in all of that. And meaning is what we make it, not what other people make it. It's what we make it. So uh, it is this existential crisis that we go through. Um, so getting started, it's like, okay, well, what is, what is your motivation? What do you need to get started for? You know, and you find the meaning and you go for it and get with a good support group. That really, truly is going to help you a lot. Other people have been there and done that. And don't make yourself wrong. I think the biggest mistake that people make when they are depressed or when they're in a situation that is depressing or in a situation where they're being abused is that they make themselves wrong for not just, you know, grabbing the brass ring and running. Well, you can't. You don't have the energy. So you take the small victories. Do not beat yourself up. Take the small victories and then build on them. You know, it's like, okay, if I could just get up and brush my teeth every day for a week, fantastic. Okay, next week, I'm going to get up, brush my teeth, and brush my hair. Great. Do that for a week. Okay, I brushed my teeth and my hair, and now I'm going to get dressed. You know, baby steps, baby victories. Moving forward is still moving forward. Does that make sense? Even if it's tiny baby steps. Don't make yourself wrong. Again, in our society, it's like not only do we have a thing against grieving, but it's the productivity. You know, it's like, oh, well, you must be productive and you must do this. You must do that. Mental masturbation is what it's called. So I must do this. I must do that. And it's like, no, 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 no. Don't don't do that to yourself. It's like if you if all you can do is get up and brush your teeth. Good job. We'll build on it tomorrow, you know, and you just take the tiny victories. So. That's my recommendation. And get with a good therapist again. Um, okay, somebody is asking that I discuss emotional neglect as abuse and also reactive abuse. Yeah, I can do that at some other point. I'm going to do a show on that. So just give me some time. I will get to it. Um, okay. Can you talk about writing it out issues when your privacy was used against you? for journaling as a kid. Oh, yes. Okay. So what abusers do is they do not respect boundaries, obviously, at all, period. They don't, they don't, they don't respect boundaries. So when we have had our journals used against us, as many of us have, I know my mom read my journals and that's why it took me a really long time to start journaling again. Um, basically, it helps to have a safe place to keep your journal that nobody knows where it is. Um, you could keep it uh, at work, you know, in your desk in a locked drawer. Uh, you can keep it at home somewhere that nobody can get into. Um, we're going to have issues with that. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely that lack of privacy. It's part of the betrayal. I'm probably going to talk about that when I talk about betrayal in, in February. Because that is a betrayal. Huge. So the way, excuse me, the way to get over that is to make the journal as safe as possible so that nobody else can get into it or read it or anything else like that. Um, some people still don't feel safe keeping a journal, and that's okay. You know, that's why I encourage write and burn. So you write it, you write it all out, and then you burn it. And then that way nobody can read it. It's for your eyes only, quite literally. So um, I would uh, write and burn. Don't keep the journal. Just write it out and then burn it. 
And that's that is the safest way to do it. That's and that's why I think I relate so much to the writing and burning because it's kind of like huh, for my eyes only. Nobody's gonna read it. I'm gonna burn it, and nobody else can can use it against me. So go pound sand. Do you see where I'm going? So yeah, so that's that's what I would do is write and burn. Okay, I think I am out of time. Good heavens, is it already a half an hour? Holy cow. Okay, so this week, uh, let's see, what am I talking about? That's a darn good question. Hold on. All right, hang on. Uh, do, do, do. Oh, why we get sucked back in. So I want to talk about because we're coming up on Valentine's Day, I want to talk about the Hoovers and why we believe them when we shouldn't. So we're going to be talking about holiday Hoovers. We're going to be talking about the Valentine Hoover because that's, that's coming, people. So um, we're going to be talking about that. All right, my loves, go have a great week. On Sunday, we're going to be talking about why we get sucked in, why we get sucked back, why we why we believe them, why we listen to them. So we're going to do that. All right. And I'm going to take those other suggestions for shows and those will be coming up in a few weeks. So, all right, my loves. And if I didn't get to your question, I will just move it over to the following week. Okay. All right, bunnies. I will talk to you later. You guys be good. Bye.